Yeah. Uh, my name is Hossel Barat. I just wanted to mention before we start, and I'll be. It was me who emailed you, and uh, me and Lubek will be leading the interview. Uh, welcome to the interview with Professor Kasper Ha. Uh, professor Kasper Ha is a philosopher. He is a professor of philosophy in the Department of Linguistics and Philosophy Philosophy at MIT. He writes about ethics about practical rationality, about metaphysics and the co connections between them. And he is the author of two books on myself and other le less important subjects and limits of kindness. And currently he's working on his third book, Living in a Strange World. Welcome Professor Kasper Ha. How can I call you? Um, hi, delighted to be here, delighted to be here. Um, so before we start the interview, I just wanted to quickly introduce you to the project that we are doing here. Uh, it's Study Buddy. Study Buddy is a nonprofit organization that aims to create a community of like highly motivated, like-minded students uh, to study together, especially people in the Central Asia in, in in our local area where education is not yet developed yet. And the reason for this is uh, because the subjects that are deeper, uh, for example, philosophy, engineering, and this kind of things are not developed in our area. And we want to connect the students uh, who are interested and st to study together. Currently, for example, we've got like groups such as engineering, biochemistry, and the philosophy, the group which I lead. And if, and just, just an ad here, and everybody can join, that, so you can go and register. Uh, we wanted the interview to be like in mostly two parts, a little bit, right? And yeah, in the first part, we wanted to talk about and get, know your opinions about consciousness. And in the, the second, like we want to talk more about ethics and rationality, if that's okay. Sure, yeah, that's fine, yeah. Okay, uh, the first question is like, the, uh, the thing that I'm interested in is, could you please define consciousness in your own words. Of course, that is the something that we haven't settled on yet. And uh, could you more elaborate on then about dualism and materialism, which one you opt for? And I don't know the ground for your thinking so. Ah, okay. So um, my, my own view is that the word consciousness is um, used by uh, lots of different philosophers in lots of different ways. It's, it's, a, it's a word that um, uh, doesn't have a fixed and stable meaning. Um, but I think that um, there are certain um, phenomena that, phenomena that people have um, been getting at when the philosophers have been getting at when they've been talking about consciousness that are very interesting. So um, uh, one of... Um, the 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 uh, sort of a dominant you know from the 1980s way of thinking about consciousness if you're a philosopher is thinking about it in terms of what it's like to be something that to, to be conscious is to be an entity such that there's something it's like to be that thing and um there's been a uh if consciousness is understood that way as as in um i'm conscious because there's something it's like to be me um, this chair here is not conscious because there's nothing it's like to be the chair. Um, and we kind of sort creatures into the kinds of things such that there are, there's something it's like to be the creature and the kinds of things such that there's nothing it's like to be the creature. Um, that way of thinking about consciousness has, um, uh, um, for a long time in philosophy, sort of invoked two kinds of reaction. There's um, one kind of person who thinks um, that uh, the facts about what it's like to be things um, are not fixed by the material facts. So um, there are various arguments to this conclusion. Um, the, the most famous arguments are um, involves kind of thought experiments in which we're supposed to imagine situations in which the material facts are exactly as they actually are, but facts about what it's like to be things are different. So uh, 
uh, for example, the, the zombie um, uh, thought experiment is supposed to be a thought, um, thought experiment in which we imagine the world being physically just as it actually is, but there's nothing it's like to be anything. There's no um, internal perspective on the world. Um, my, my own view about consciousness is that um, these thought experiments have been um, kind of misunderstood. I think that these um, thought experiments are in imagining that there's nothing it's, um, it's like to be something or imagining being somebody else. Um, we are uh, what we're doing is we're imagining that there's no perspective on the world. We're imagining a world without an eye in it. And that imagining a world without an eye in it is distinct from imagining a world in which nothing is conscious. And so uh, I do think that the people who think that there are facts that are not material facts about the world are right, but the facts have been misunderstood to be facts about consciousness, these extra facts, and in fact, they should be understood to be facts about um, what kinds of things are present uh, where I am in the world. So I think it, my, my view, I spelled this out in my first book, is that there are extra non-material facts about the world, um, but those facts are facts about presence, facts about who I am, and the day say doesn't reduce, these facts about who I am don't reduce to material non-perspectival facts. So that's broadly my view about consciousness. Um, thank you very much. And like, we were kind of interested in, because this is about like the phenomenon right now, uh, the question is, can machines or like then AI reach consciousness? And why do you think so? And we would love to hear that. Um, so, 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 so I, I guess I, I'm, I think the obstacle is, is in arguing that they can't. Um, I, I see no reason if, if a machi machine is just a, um, a human constructed entity, um, I, I don't see versus an entity constructed by evolution. I see no reason why that it was constructed by humans rather than that it was constructed by evolution, why that would be a reason why it couldn't be conscious. Nor would I see a reason if a machine is understood to be a thing that's made of metal and plastic and, um, and uh, humans are things made of you know, carbon. Then again, I wouldn't see that either of these, that would also be an obstacle to its being conscious. So, so, um, I feel like um, the, the burden of argument is on someone to, uh, to argue that machines can't be conscious. So why, why couldn't machines be conscious? Um, there's a further question of whether we, we think that whatever consciousness is, it's a, it's a property that's gonna be had by machines you know, constructed in the next few decades. Um, and that's more to do with the actual nitty gritty of AI and um, what's actually gonna happen. Um, but yeah, I suppose I'd ask the question back as, do, do you feel that there's a, persuasive argument that machines can't be conscious? Uh, yeah, I, I read about like John Searle and him saying that like con um, consciousness is something that's, that, that is like cannot be gained by machines because it's their kind of algorithms. So maybe that could yeah, be so, the so John Searle, Yes, so John Searle had, had, a, had an argument that's quite famous. It's called the Chinese Rome argument, which is that the paper you read? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so he, he he, he thought that he could show by way of this thought experiment that um, machines couldn't be conscious. He sort of imagines, um, uh, he, he imagines um, just for the, those people who in the room who aren't aware of it, um, John Searle imagines a situation in which there's a guy who's um, uh, processing uh, tiles. He's, there's input coming to him. There's a bunch of tiles being um, uh, uh, thrown in his direction or being pushed in his direction. And he um, manipulates these tiles um, in accordance with rules given to him by a rule book. And um, I'm slightly simplifying it, but the rule book gives him rules, tiles come in, he manipulates the tiles, and then in accordance with the directions of the rule book, sends certain tiles out. And uh, and the idea is he's, the rule book is so sophisticated that in fact, what he's doing is he's computing a function 
such that any machine that computes this function will pass what's called the Turing test. It will appear conscious. It will appear like it's having an excellent conversation, in this case in Chinese, by way of the tiles. So the guy, the guy doesn't understand Chinese. Chinese tiles come to him. Um, he reads the rule book. He reconfigures them. And he sends Chinese tiles back out. And it would seem to any Chinese speaker that this guy was having a fluent, interesting conversation about philosophy in Chinese. But Searle says, uh, clearly this guy isn't thinking. And uh, clearly he's not in the relevant where, uh, uh, way aware of the things he's talking about. And so a machine, even though it um, might uh, be appear from the outside to be thinking and talking about stuff. And you know, we, have, we, say, we say to the machine, hi, how are you today? The machine says, I'm feeling a little bit blah, blah, blah. You know, I have these long conversations with the machine. It might appear as if it was um, conscious, but Searle says it would be no more conscious than that guy in the room processing tiles. Um, my, my own view is this is not a very good argument um, because um, uh, we might want, the, the, the guy is kind of the analog of the central processing unit of the machine. Um, and uh, we, we don't perhaps want to say the central processing unit is conscious, but we want to say the whole machine is. And likewise in Searle's situation, if it really was, this guy really was um, processing tiles in such a way as to be fully passing the Turing test, um, uh, then I, I think you would want to say that the entire system was conscious. Perhaps not the guy, but the whole system, which includes the book, the room he's in, the tiles and so on and so forth. You'd say, yeah, it's conscious. Uh, okay, like even if you decide that the uh, like AI is conscious, okay, a little bit. Let me first give, give me a question. The question is, how about AI ethics? That is, like AI bases is uh, like his its decisions on the set of rules that we put in for now. But how should we put in the rules or, or morals? Even we haven't figured out ourselves yet what would be the way that we could do so. And there are like lots of examples the self-driving cars uh, making well, yeah, so, so that's a super interesting question. There's lots of interesting questions about AI ethics. So one, one um, interesting question is, suppose following up from your last question, that we have decided that, mach that machines are conscious. The first question you may, may ask is, generally we think that conscious things have rights, right? We think that there are certain ways that it's, a, once a thing is conscious, there are ways that it's appropriate to treat it and ways that are inappropriate to treat it. There's nothing bad you can do to a rock, right? But there are bad things you can do to conscious creatures. So do machines have um, the kinds of moral rights that humans and animals have? Um, so that's one interesting question about AI. Um, consciousness, sorry, morality, ethics of AI. Another interesting question. So I, I just want to follow up a little bit on what you were saying. So you were saying, um, so if the machines are acting, if they're doing stuff, um, the question is what rules should we program into them to make sure that they behave right? Is that is that the basic question you're asking? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, so yeah, so 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 all I can I guess all I can say is that there's a, there's a huge amount of work. That's a really exciting, enormous topic. There's an, an, a lot of work going into that topic right now, because yeah, people are, we're increasingly delegating decision making to machines and algorithms, and we want the algorithms to make the right kinds of decisions. So one, did, did, did you mention the trolley problem? Did you, did you say? Uh, I didn't mention, but we could also say that. I mean- oh, okay. So okay. You, you said something about self-driving cars. That, that was- Yeah, it, it's kind of similar yeah. to trolley problem. So we could just say yeah, yes. problem. So, yes, so, so one, yeah, so one issue is, is one, 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 one kind of example where AI may be making decisions, um, you know, absent human intervention is on the road. And the road, as you know, is a is a. <laughs> I don't know how your roads are, but there's there's a high you know it's it's a high fatality. There's a high risk zone, 
And so the decisions that are going to be made by self-driving cars will have impact on who, who has accidents and who doesn't and how bad the accidents are for whom. And so the question is, you know, what, what we, how we want to program them to behave in certain kinds of situations, rather than just trusting to the mess of human instinct. Yeah, you have to program the machine and you have to kind of anticipate the kinds of situations that it's going to face. So th this is, nobody's resolved this, but what I can broadly say is this is a, an important and very interesting job. It's in, in part because, yeah, it's, it's a problem that nobody's really faced before. I mean, we faced it implicitly when we were training people to drive and we trained people, for example, to leave adequate braking zones between that, yourself and the car in front of you. But you don't, um, uh, you can't sort of foresee every eventuality when you do that and you understand also people will respond differently to the training. The algorithm will properly executed will be executed the same way by every self-driving car. So, so we kind of have to um, uh, make decisions rather than just relying on the mass of human instinct, we have to make decisions now about how the self-driving cars are gonna behave in future contexts. And so, yeah, so you, you face something, you know, trolley problem-ish like situations of, you know, um, is the first priority of the car to protect these occupants or to protect outside people? Um, you know, it's, it's possibly gonna behave differently in situations if its first priority is to protect the safety of its occupants than if its first priority is to like minimize overall, you know, the suffering. And so somebody's going to have to make decisions about how to, um, and probably not leave it up to the consumer because the consumer have asked, do you want to buy a car that whose first priority is to, is to protect your health or a car whose first priority is something else is probably gonna go for the former kind of car. <laughs> um, but that's not necessarily, it's not necessarily in all our interest to have cars like that. So mm. that would be an example of, of, of what's um, sometimes called a, you know, a, a, um, a multi-agent prisoner's dilemma where we all have an incentive to drive in cars it's in all of our interest, individual interests that the particular car we're driving in have as its first priority to protect our health, but it's in all of our collective interest that we all not drive in cars like that. So that's called a, a multi-agent prisoner's dilemma. And so, yeah, so very interesting question about how we're going to resolve that. So yeah, this is, if you, if you guys are interested, this is the future and it's, there's a big demand for people who are like smart people who are interested in AI and interested in ethics and, in, and, and engine, have some competency in engineering to think out these kinds of problems. Um, yeah, so that's one instance. There are lots of other instances where AI is going to be making decisions where we need to think very carefully about the kinds of decisions that it's making. Um, so the sorts of the sorts of cases that have have um, uh, you know arisen in the U.S are cases where you have kind of automated decision-making or with respect to, for example, parole. So um, when prisoners come up for parole in the US, um, uh, one of the factors that, so, so you, you know, a prison sentence, you're given a prison sentence and you can get off early for good behavior. And if you convince the parole board that you are, um, uh, uh, that you are not a danger to society and you've served enough time and so on and so forth. And one of the, the factors that um, may um, influence the decision of the parole board is a judgment about how likely it is that you will commit another crime, you will commit a crime again, that you'll be back in jail. Yeah, and the and, interesting, oh, I'm sorry. This go ahead. Uh, thing is like, I'm also curious, I think everybody is, who will it be, who's responsible so will it be when the like self-driving cars, let's say the famous example, for example, results in some kind of damage? Will it be the company, uh, the car, the owner? <laughs> yeah, so 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 that, that's an interesting liability question. I mean, that is a legal question, but it's a very important question to resolve because at, at the moment in the US, there are tens of thousands of fatalities every year. And, and even if you know, we reduce that by half. I mean, as it's tens multiple of thousands, we're still gonna have, um, you know, um, uh, what, five figure fatality rates in the US. And uh, yeah, that's a lot of potential lawsuits. 
for me, that's that's not such an interest. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. I don't think that's a morally very interesting question. I mean, that's just how society comes to accommodate these things. And I mean, the, the, that it's a, it's a largely political question because um, on the one hand, the, the government will want to incentivize the um, production of self-driving cars. On the other hand, the government will be aware that if um, every self-driving car company knows that it's going to be sued for the accidents that are inevitably going to occur, they're not going to release this technology. So it's a kind of practical question about how to, how to, um, uh, how to manage this. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, it, it surely can't be the consumer the particular owner of the car who's consumed because I mean who's who's sued because um, the, the accident is the fault of the algorithm, and and you have no ability. <laughs> the, the consumer is going to have no idea what algorithm the car is running, and have have no responsibility of having created it. Um, so um, on the other hand, it's very interesting that um, the def defining what is consciousness will be like a defining moment because like you know. Uh, for example, um, I'm pretty sure you've heard about the book like by Adam Douglas, uh, like Hitchhiker to Gal in the Galaxies. And like, say, in the restaurants, they had animals that wanted to get eaten. Like, is that thing cons consciousness? Like, and also on the other hand, so do AI need to appropriate rights to make decisions? Like, you know, you're going to give a... Um, AI a consciousness but if you give it consciousness of course it's like gonna make mistake as um, like as a person I don't know so it's very interesting like to what yeah. extent like the freedom is gonna be granted especially given that like you're not gonna um, suit them sue them as you're gonna sue people yes well, okay, so 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 two interesting interesting things you were pointing out. So the first thing, just just to, um, uh, 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 you were pointing out, is is this? I, I I don't know if other people have read this, but you're talking about the second novel in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series, where um, at one point our heroes end up at the restaurant at the end of the universe, where there's a cow that has been bred both to be fully sentient, so it it can have. It has feelings and, and it can talk and um, and it behaves. You know, you can relate to it as as you would to another human being. Um, but it also has um, been bred to be such that its its highest joy in life and its highest desire in life is to be consumed. And so it appears in front of the diners and says, "Oh, please eat me!" and look at this you'll what you enjoy this bit of me. Look, oh look how what a delicious steak this will be, and and so on and so forth. Um, and actually, that's a, a very interesting, it raises an interesting question, and I don't know what you what you feel about it. I mean, with, within the context of the novel, that is designed to elicit a feeling of disgust in you. You're supposed to think this is very wrong. You know, that's the, the, the sort of the, the, the emotion that is, is you're know, trying to elicit from, from his reader. He's trying to think, you know, this is weird and perverse and wrong. And... Um, uh, the world should not be like this. But if that's right, that would be a counterexample to a sort of utilitarian way of looking at things. Because on a utilitarian way of looking at things, what matters is um, whether or not, the different views, but whether or not what you do um, on balance increases pleasure in the world and reduces suffering. Other views say whether what you do um, satisfies the desires of morally significant creatures. And on either metric, it would seem like killing this cow, supposing you do the killing is actually happens painlessly, it's like painlessly euthanized. That's exactly what it wants. So it would seem from a utilitarian point of view that, that would be an excellent thing to do. And supposing it gets, it gets, get, get, gets get great pleasure in the anticipation of being killed and every moment that it's not about to be killed, it's in great pain or it feels pain, then from a utilitarian point of view, killing the cow is exactly the thing to do. In fact, this is great. It's a fantastic thing. What we should do is we should breed cows just like this and enjoy the eating of them. And we've created the utilitarian best of all possible worlds. But I take it was that. Um, and so this could this could this 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 example could be thought of as a kind of a problem for a utilitarian way of thinking. 
And this might come about because, um, uh, yeah, if we if we create um, AI um, that has no desire for self-preservation and for you know and so on and so forth, it's kind of like the cow. Then um, then you might wonder, can we? Um, uh, are there really many any moral prohibitions against mistreating our mistreating it after all it wants to be mistreated i mean i could ask you Oleg Beck, is that is that your name um what was your reaction when you read you read that scene in the book did you did you did you think woohoo great they should kill the cow or did you think poor cow somehow it's being terribly mistreated well clearly um i had the bias in the sense that like as a human it would feel feel very very weird and yeah but like i felt repelled yeah but like it kind of um roots into metaphysics of ethics like what is ethics like what is right and wrong like is it okay to um uh, create such creatures because we are creating them like it's not by nature but on the other hand why wouldn't be it okay if we design it not the nature because nature like is not a perfect um system and like um so because i've been reading some of your works and like they all mostly um went to considering different frameworks of thinking about physics of about metaphysics of ethics mm -hmm. and like just as the conclusion seems to be for me is that um as of now we're human beings we don't have definite answers about ethics and it's going to be mostly just depend on the on our biases and our perspectives and like just on the situation itself rather than some universal loss and so like regarding like the philosophical part like do you think that um people should carry on being human or should people um just use such kind of frameworks of thinking about ethics like explicitly and try to find the best way because like it seems like it's would be very weird no no i understood so yes so 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 so, so moral philosophy has traditionally focused on i mean there's different different one one um uh one way of thinking about ethics which is actually has a history that you know, can be traced to sort of Aristotle on some views, is that the way that you should think about ethics is we should all try and train ourselves to be virtuous people and then just react to situations in the way that whatever virtuous people do. So we should just, um, we should recognize that situations are, morally fraught situations are all extremely complex. And there's no way of, trying to come up with a general rule or principle that will tell you what to do in every situation. The best you can do is trying to make yourself into a good person and trust that as a good person, you will react in the right way when put in a new situation. That's one way of thinking about ethics. There isn't then much thinking to do. It's kind of the, the subject sort of stops there because um, uh, 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 we don't get into the business of trying to formulate rules. Most ethics in the sort of 20th century and beyond has tried to, try to focus on a different way of, of thinking about it, the, the way where you try to come up with general rules and principles that will tell you how to behave in situations. You say, it's not that every situation is so complex that we can't come up with any general rules and principles. Um, no, uh, there are general rules and principles that well, just as there is, you know, there are in, if you're an engineer, you may say, it's not that every situation is so complex that we can't come up with general physical laws that apply to all situations. Um, so it is that every moral situation is not so complex that we can, can't, can't find general moral principles that apply to all situations. And so, um, uh, and the, the AI stuff is interesting because, because the computers, AI is not just going to react in some ineffable way to sit, well, maybe, well, it's complicated. Machine learning might actually, but um, uh, more traditional forms of AI will, will not just be reacting in an instinctive way to the situation that comes to them. They'll have sort of rules programmed into them. That's actually pushed 
that's created a sort of practical drive for the rule kind of way of thinking about ethics. Now, the problem with the rule kind of way of thinking about ethics is that um, the rules that people have focused on sort of traditionally have tended to be quite crude rules. They've either been some form of utilitarianism or some form of deontology, some, some view according to which the general principle, the ultimate principle of ethics is um, say, maximize um, uh, pleasure, minimize suffering, or um, some kind of uh, rule that says, whatever you do, don't violate rights. And these are the rights that people have. And they tend to be quite um, sort of cumbersome. And they tend, tend to seem that these, these rules and principles tend to seem to generate lots of counterexamples. There are lots of situations where it seems like the rule doesn't say the right kind of thing about the situation. And my view is if that's been a problem, it's not that the whole method of trying to come up with general rules that tell us what we should do in different situations, there's something wrong with that. It's just that we've maybe been focusing on the wrong rules. Um, so yeah, I think we shouldn't give up on a kind of a, a general theoretical approach to ethics. Yeah, so yeah, it's very interesting because if we you like, if some person has absolute ethical values, well, say like it's, it's going to be like Ubermensch, you know, like, like I feel like the ordinary people would not feel very um, tolerant to that because, you know, um, there is an um, example like um, where the world is ruled by an AI, AI, and some continent like there is an epidemic of very deadly virus and AI decides just to cut off that continent and not allow anyone, even though they are like healthy because there is some certainty, some probability that they can be um, ill themselves. So like just cutting out the whole continent, like people aren't gonna like that. Most people aren't gonna like that because of course there is gonna be interconnection. Like, um, I mean, if we, um, say that the world became so globalized that they have relatives everywhere. So like people are not gonna like this decision, but it's right. And it's mm. but, like, is it ethical towards that pe towards those people? And like, of course it's gonna depend on whether you're looking at it from an individual or utilitarian point of view. So, I mean, like, um, like what do you think about this attitude of ordinary people and us to um, like, as an ordinary people like not someone trying to think about it in some um, elaborate metaphysical ways but like um, when it's related to our close people so what do you think about this bias of ours well well so so, so an interesting feature of utilitarianism um, is that the theory doesn't demand that we be able to be able to justify, sorry, we be able to justify our the right decisions to all the people they impact. So if, say, from a utilitarian point of view, the right thing to do is to sacrifice you for the greater good. So, so um, we're in some situation where um, I don't know for some medical reason, the greater good of the community will be served by doing something terrible to you, right? Um, the, the sort of classic example of, of this that gets used in intro ethics courses is we imagine that um, uh, you and five of your friends have come to the doctor and your five friends are in desperate need of blood, right? And they've, they've all got the same blood type as you. And if they don't have a blood transfusion, like right now, they're all gonna die. And, um, and you are there to have your tonsils out, you know, to have some minor operation. And the doctor looks at you and realizes you have exactly the blood of that type. And this is the only source of blood in the hospital. And if the doctor sucks all the blood out of you and puts it in, you know, a pint each in each of your five friends, they'll live. Otherwise they'll die, but of course you'll turn into a shriveled dead raisin. And um, from a utilitarian point of view, it seems like that's the thing to do because five people will live, right? Whereas if we leave things alone, only one alone, only one person will live. Five beats one. Um, 
but of course uh it's 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 it, we we can't then you, you you said the problem is people won't understand that they're being treated in an ethical way and the utilitarian then has a, is going to have a hard job explaining to you why this is the th i mean at best the explanation to you is going to be uh sorry i'm killing you but the greater good is being served by my doing so somehow I know this is terrible for you, but your death is outweighed by the deaths of the other people. But you're not gonna find that very satisfying as you die. You're not gonna be like, um, oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, you're gonna feel like, wait, um, this is, I'm being mistreated, I have rights and so on and so forth. So yes, utilitarianism does a very poor job at, the utilitarian is always going to struggle to explain to the individuals that have been quarantined or killed or in your example, quarantined, um, why it is that um, uh, what's being done is okay. I mean, you may well say, I don't care about the greatest good. I care about what's good for me. There are different kinds of theories that may do a slightly better job of explaining, say, what's going on in quarantine. You know, an another sort of theory could, could say, it's okay to quarantine you, even if that imposes. So uh, uh, suppose that, that we're now not getting very far away from reality, but suppose there's a disease going around and um, you, get you get quarantined, even though you feel perfectly fine. And it, it's not in your interest to be quarantined. Maybe you're quarantined with a bunch of people who are obviously sick, and you're actually more likely to get the disease in this quarantine than if you were just le left, 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 left out. The utilitarian justification for that would be, yeah, it's not in your interest to do this, but your interest is outweighed by the interests of all the other people. Other explanations, but other explanations might be, you know, you would, you are participating in a community and you would yourself endorse rules if you didn't know what, where you would be in the community, you would yourself endorse rules that allowed community quarantine because it would be in your interest that we have such rules. So it's in all of our collective interest from behind a veil of ignorance where we don't know who we are, that we live in a society where there are rules that allow for quarantine. And, and, so, and so this is why you, although you found yourself in a situation where you unfortunately are not going to benefit from that rule, nonetheless, you, um, in a certain sense, the rule is in your interest too. That's a theory that tries to, does, does a better job of trying to justify to the individual why the hardship and, um, is being inflicted on the individual. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, okay, I just wanted to take a step back and talk about like consequentialism. I read in your book, uh, The Limits of Kindness, that about your talk with Professor Julius Thompson, you, correct me if I'm wrong, kind of given by a human fuel uh, situation, opted for consequentialist side nine years ago. I don't know, it will be alone right now. And I wanted to know, how did you become from that point of view to here now, and what were the, I don't know, arguments, the thoughts that changed you? Okay, human fuel was, this was another example along the lines of what we're talking about now, just so people can understand what we're talking about. This is a situation where you can kill one person so as to save five others. So um, my thinking about situations like that was influenced by the following sort of consideration. This is there in the limits of kindness and there in also a subsequent paper I wrote. Um, uh, let's suppose there's one person who's, in, who's, so there's one person who's going to live if you don't act um, and five people who will die if you don't act. And then if you act, the one person will die and the five will live. You can kill the one so as to save the five. That's the situation we're talking about. There are lots of variants and lots of stories where this is, this is true, but that's the kind of situation we're talking about. I was influenced by the following sort of thought. Imagine that those six people don't, you know, you know who the six people are. They're your friends, call them A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Um, and uh, imagine nobody knows where they are. Right. So um, imagine that uh, uh, that um, uh, um, 
as far as you're concerned and as far as they're concerned, there's a, a sixth of a chance that person A is the person who you're going to kill, right? If you kill the one. And five sixths of a chance that person A is one of the five who'll be saved if you kill the one. And same for person B, the same for person C, the same for person D. Now imagine that you only cared about person A. You like and love them, that you just, you adore them, that they're your first, they're your first priority in life. What would you do? So I'll ask you the question, what would you do? In this situation, it's like, Can I uh, chip in? Sure. Well, it, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, if I got you right, the, the question is like, uh, case one, everyone is given the same weight, like the importance, I mean, out of six people. And the case two is uh, one person is more uh, of, has more weight in terms of considering, considering well, no, no, well, let's assume, in our, in our example, let's assume that the six people, we'll call them A, B, C, D, E, e uh, sorry, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Let's suppose that those six people, they're, they're all friends, they're all pe like people here, they're all of the same age, they're equally important. Let's just assume, assume that in our example. It's not that one of them is the prime minister of the country or one of them is about to cure cancer or anything like that. They're all equally important. But let's suppose they've been shuffled. They, nobody knows. Um, if you like, you could make it like the trolley problem. So somebody's on a footbridge, you can push that person onto the, tr onto the track so as to prevent uh, the trolley from whacking into the other five. But let's suppose they're all in suitcases. So nobody knows who's in which suitcase. You don't know who's in which suitcase, right? So, uh, so now the question is, should you push the suitcase on the footbridge onto the track? That involves killing one person to save five. And imagine, let's just imagine a, a version of the case where your only priority was the, the interests of person A. Call them Alex, right? Um, you would think if I push, there's a five sixth chance that person A will live. If I don't push, there's only a one sixth chance that person A will live. Person A will probably die if I don't push. Person A will probably live if I push. And so if you only cared about them, this is the way of thinking, you would push. And likewise, if you only cared about B, you would push. And if you only cared about C, you would push. And if you only cared about D, you would push. And if you only cared about E, you would push. You would push. Each of them is such that if you only cared about them, you would push. So I then think, well, that th these are the only people involved. And if I cared about them all, I would push. And so I would, this is a situation in which I would kill someone, one person to save five, um, because uh, that would be the, 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 the right thing to do if I was acting out of personal concern for each of them, if I cared about them all. And so that led me to think that there are clear examples of situations in which the sort of utilitarian way of thinking gets it right because there are clear examples of situations where we should kill one person so as to save five. Now, that's not to say utilitarianism or the, general, the more general traditional consequentialist apparatus is always right. It's just to say that there are situations like that. So that was kind of what led me to think that um, Judy Thompson was not right about there being a blanket prohibition against killing one so as to save five. She did not react well to this, I should say. She was my colleague. She's unfortunately she's dead now, but she was not happy about this. <laughs> um, but there we are. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I was going to ask you, what do you guys think about that? If you were in that situation, suitcases, one on the footbridge, five on the track, you knew all the six people involved, you didn't know who was in which suitcase, which suitcase what would you do? Uh, let's do it like that. If you want to push, send plus. If you don't want, like send minuses. You don't. Uh, then we'll see. Personally, like if I cared about A, uh, I I would push, even though it seems weird because it seems like in other situations 
to sacrifice one person to, I don't know, save your relative maybe? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so uh, did the pluses mean, the pluses mostly mean push, is that it? So yeah, yes, yes. Most people mean push. Yeah, so yeah, I, 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 I think that is the reaction. Although interestingly, a view that I have is that this is very different from a situation in which you do know who is who is well, right? Mm -hmm. Suppose now you know it's Alex on the footbridge. The kind of reasoning I gave before where each of them is such that if you cared about them, you would push, that doesn't apply now. Suppose Alex is on the footbridge, you know it's Alex. And then your other five friends, the five other people are all on the track. Now you, you can't apply the reasoning I just applied. Right? So, yeah. and I actually think these cases are very different. And so I, I'm not of the view that you should push when it's Alex, when you know it's Alex. So in that way, I'm not a consequentialist or a traditional utilitarian who says, yeah, you should push even when you know who they are. Um, so uh, thank you for the response. So like, since we're all like, or mostly our high schoolers here and like, most of us are interested in philosophy as such. I personally have a very long story of um, passion in philosophy. Like, what would you be your kind of framework of um, exploring philosophy? Like, because I have watched some videos and they say, start from secondary sources because you're not gonna understand what exactly the philosophers are going to try, trying to say in their books. And also just the way of putting philosophy in your life. It's an interesting question. When I started, that's a great question. When I started off, um, uh, I, I, I started reading philosophy. I was also a high schooler and I just started reading it in my free time. And I, I just, just I, I went to the bookshop and then to the library and I just read as much stuff as I could. It was all totally, un, nobody was telling me what to read. And I thought this is way cooler than anything I've ever read and anything I was studying in school. Yeah. Um, and, um, and indeed, I, it seemed to me because philosophy is so irreverent, it's so unlike the way I was being taught at school where you had to learn certain facts, you had to memorize things and you had to sort of repeat what this professor was saying back to you. And philosophy is, is all about questioning everything and uh, you, you, nothing is kind of stable. It just seemed like something you couldn't do in an academic context to me. And so I read a lot of philosophy then, and then it wasn't until really much later that I started studying it in a sort of traditional way in school. Um, so, you know, I enjoyed that. So the first thing to say is you don't have to study it academically. Um, uh, and, but if you want to sort of get a more systematic sense of what's going on um, in the field of philosophy, it is helpful to read a sort of compilation of things that's been prepared by someone who's familiar with the field. Um, now, the, the question of whether to go to primary sources or whether to go to sort of commentaries is on the one hand, primary sources are more fun, but you're also right that the commentary will lay things out often more clearly than the primary source did. Because when people have had a bit of time to reflect on an issue, they can lay things out more clearly than when the issue is first getting worked out. Um, I mean, as places I would recommend to look, look for, for a slightly more sort of systematic look at philosophy and to get an introduction, was things like there's a, a thing called the Norton Introduction to Philosophy. It was edited recently, um, which is, it is, and I don't know if you, if you guys have access to libraries um, or um, whether that's the kind of thing that might be in libraries that you have access to or the accessibility on the internet. I'm not actually sure about that, but that's an example of a situation where that was um, a bunch of readings where they have primary, Somebody selected, say, in the topic of like the metaphysics of personal identity, they will have selected readings through history and they'll have some commentary on the readings, kind of explaining what's going on in the readings. 
and they will have been a bunch of readings that are selected to give you a broad introduction to the topic and to give a sense of why it's interesting. And it's, it's based on you know, introductory philosophy courses that people have been teaching for years at US universities. And so there's been a lot of time to sort of reflect and think this is really a good way of introducing the subject. So that anthology, I would think, is a very good place to start to try to get a more systematic look at, um, uh, at philosophy and try to get a sort of more, a, 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 a more general ground. And then the other thing is also just, you know, to go to a university and start taking courses there and rely on the professors to be hopefully <laughs> presenting material to you in a, in a, in a um, uh, you know, a good way. Um, yeah, is that helpful? Um, Absolutely. Um, thanks for laying out this. And following this question, like I, I'm like I myself, as an someone who's been following philosophy for years, like I have been thinking, what kind of stuff do philosophers do? I mean, I've been considering taking major or minor or just um, additional courses on philosophy, and I have researched a lot about what kind of jobs I might take if I take a philosophy degree and they mostly come down to just saying you're going to be good at writing you're going to be good at logic so go to computer science writing and stuff but like what what would you say from your personal experience about the employment and like employability of philosophical skills and stuff um so so uh i i just just I just Google, sorry, I just dropped a link into a place where you can get the Norton Introduction philosophy. There's a used one there for thirty dollars. I don't, you know, it's still money. I don't, if you can get your school li library to buy it, that you, you, you know, that that might be um, a way in. Um, okay, in, in, it, there's there's two kinds of of um, of uh, ways in which if if you have an undergraduate degree in, in philosophy, you might that might work towards your being employed somewhere. One is to become um, a, a professional philosopher, which would re, which would require getting also a, a, a master's on a PhD, and um, if you do that, typically the jobs are at universities, like the job I have, and you're you're teaching philosophy and doing research in philosophy. Um, there are now some companies, particularly some tech companies in like in Silicon Valley, that are employing philosophers partly because they're thinking about issues related to the ethics of AI. Um, uh, and so there are also some jobs in industry for philosophers, but mostly traditionally, if you want to be a philosopher, the way to be a philosopher is to teach philosophy at a university. That's like most philosophy jobs are like that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's quite competitive, but it's a great, it's, I've loved that. It's a great life, you know, it's because it's, it's you get a lot of time to do research and you also teach and you just, you're surrounded by young people who are like enthusiastic about the subject and you're helping them work out like the most important truth. It's just a great life. Um, but uh, like many things, it's competitive and you have to work at it and so on and so forth. Um, then there's, what if you get an undergraduate degree in philosophy? Is that helpful for anything else? Well, you're not specifically being trained to do anything other than be a philosopher, but the kinds of ways of thinking that you will, you know, basically you're being trained in are also helpful to do other things. So for example, in the US, um, many people who with philosophy majors who don't actually become philosophers become lawyers or business people. Um, and you know, philosophers tend to be, particularly if you study analytic philosophy, you, you, you are trained to think very clearly about difficult, fuzzy, complicated problems. And that's a skill that turns out to be very helpful. So for example, um, uh, uh, when, when people graduate from U.S. university and they, 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 uh, try, they, they then um, uh, uh, want to go to graduate school, they have traditionally taken an exam called the graduate record exam, um, which is a universal exam sort of taken by people who've, taken, who've, who've studied all majors that's supposed to give a kind of baseline of comparison for people applying to graduate school. And the philosophers have always done better than any other undergraduate major on that exam um, because they're very well trained in the kind of analytic thinking that the exam tests. And there's lots of other kinds of instances where um, philosophers are, um, you can have evidence that philosophers are very well trained for doing kind of clear headed marketable thinking. So yeah, so 
basically your choices are to um, go into philosophy as in teaching philosophy at a university or do something else. But if you do something else, the kinds of skills, thinking skills that you've been trained in will probably be helpful. Very interesting because I remember there was also one job related to philosophy, but you can get it, I guess, with master's degree. And like it's working some kind of like psychotherapists, but as a philosopher, like you just, yeah, you just like um, try to explain to your clients, like um, clients, like what is life and stuff, not like in psychological terms, but like from philosophy and just like cancel, canceling, yeah counseling it's interesting i know that is a thing yeah i i haven't um uh i i know that philosophy therapists that's a thing too um it's sort of a mixture of um people um who, who it's a mixture of traditional therapy which focuses on your psychological being with well-being with philosophy and yeah that's cool um uh uh it's th yeah that's definitely a, that's definitely a thing too I don't, I don't know if, if in Uzbekistan that's a that's something that's an established profession. I, I don't know, but but it's yeah, there are some people like that in the US. Uh, as you mentioned, Uzbekistan, I wanted to add something about Uzbekistan, and that is like in Uzbekistan, we've got I don't know if we have it in America or not, a huge bias towards philosophy, not a good one. And people think that I mean, the audience here is not probably so because we are kind of the people who want to fly to us. Uh, but from my personal experience in the village, uh, 99 out of 100, let's say 100 or 100, say that like philosophy is a useless thing. It's just the thing, I don't know, they also add re religious beliefs and everything. Did you know about this? And what are your comments on that? Um, well, uh... There, there may be different sources, different things behind it. Um, so, so one th one sentiment that may be behind it is that um, uh, people who are being trained to be philosophers aren't being trained to do something practical that yields, um, you know, the production of a product, a, a widget. You know, <laughs> a, it's not like engineering where you're making something with your hands um, and um, Another source of the bias may be the sense, which I think is not right, that philosophers don't make progress um, in their thinking. It, you just turn, you're turning around in circles and forever going around in circles. That's not true at all, in that there's been tremendous progress in philosophy, and philosophy has, you know, historically has yielded almost the last large majority of academic d disciplines had their origins in a, kind, a way of thinking that was at the time called philosophy. So the in ancient Greece, the early mathematicians were philosophers. The early, you know, the early, what we now call physicists, they were called natural philosophers. This is um, uh, many hundreds of years later. The early economists were called philosophers. The early linguist, linguists were called philosophers. The early psychologists were called philosophers. Like philosophy breeds other academic disciplines. So it's a very constructive, productive thing in the long run. But people who don't know about it think, oh, they, they, they just go around in circles and they make no progress. And then another source of the bias against it that you may be feeling is that is the sense that uh, philosophical thinking, because it's um, resistant to dogma and believing things just by faith, is kind of threatens traditional religion. And so people, religious people sometimes don't like uh, philosophy because philosophers are trained not to accept things on faith. Um, you ask, why is that true? You don't just say it's true because I'm told it's true or because um, uh, the great book insisted that it was true. And so that's, it's, it's sometimes thought of as, as, as um, threatening to uh, traditional religious practice and belief. I mean, of course, there are actually philosophers or analytic philosophers who are um, also quite serious, um, uh, you know, religious people as well. So. Um, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's not true that um, practicing philosophy is incompatible with leading a religious life. And indeed, I, I'm very much of the view that um, philosophy is the underlying push to do philosophy is, or at least my underlying drive 
to do philosophy is to achieve a kind of spiritual understanding, which is not unlike the kind of understanding that people traditionally have tried to achieve through religion. Okay, and I think our time is, is kind of finishing. It was supposed to be 45 minutes, but it's already an hour. Uh, the last thing is um, more of kind of, I would say your, your advice for us, uh, not specifically for the ones, for example, who want to, let's say, major in philosophy, but just in general, who are interested in, uh, in philosophy. How would you recommend them, I don't know, to employ something in philosophy, to read, and what is your just best advice for us from Uzbekistan? Um, Okay, so from Uzbekistan, well, well so, 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 so the book I, I, I put in the chat there, that's got a really good introduction to lots of, um, uh, lots of different fields in philosophy, if you can somehow get a hold of it. In, in terms of stuff that's available through the internet, you, know, you, you can look at, there's a thing called the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is kind of dry and summarizes a lot of stuff. The articles aren't fun to read because they tend to be very programmatic and dry, but they do have a lot of really helpful information and links to them. So a lot of the stuff is just available online. And so if, if you wanted to, to so for example, and, so, and you can use that as a guide to what the really important seminal articles are. So for example, if you wanted to read about consciousness, so you talked about um, uh, um, uh, the Chinese room argument, Searle's famous paper, you can also read, there's a famous article by Frank Jackson on colors, which introduces his Mary example. That's, that's again, available online. You can get the PDF online. So one of the things to do is identify a subject, say it's consciousness, for example, and then um, go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, look at what the sort of seminal important articles are. And almost all those articles will be available for free on PDF online, and then read them and see what you think. And the, they're not, it's one of the great things about philosophy is it's, although there are people who know much more about it than others and who, you know, you get, as you get, like anything is you get practiced in it, you get better at it. It's not the kind of thing that in principle, you, you, uh, you need expertise in order to understand, in order to relate it to your life. They're talking about you. We talk about consciousness. They're talking about you and, um, and you, you should be able to understand it and it should be immediately relevant to you. Um, so don't feel that, you know, this is a branch. This is something that's got nothing to do with me. Um, they are, you know, this is, this is um, uh, you are as eligible and as, um, uh, you know, as appropriate a subject of doing this as anybody. So that's a great thing. Well, Mike, do you want to say till the like last point? Then we can just finish. Yeah, I just thought about like I've been reading a book about related to philosophy, and there was a quote that was pertained to uh, Wittgenstein, and I'm not, um, I'm not actually sure if it was Wittgenstein who said that, but like he has a books book Logicus Tractatus, I guess, and like where he lays out the logical foundation of the world, and but like what he says, what he is supposedly said about it is that like, guys, yes, um, like there are lots of logical things. But what I wanted to say is that everything important in our life is actually like outside of logic. I think you Can made I it. Him? Oh, sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, uh, it, yeah, I, I wouldn't take that too seriously. I, Wittgenstein loved having the last word, and um, he, he wanted, you know, he wanted to say, um, "Once I'm done, everybody should just shut up." <laughs> and um, and uh, and it was like, "Yes, I finally, I've ended it." Uh, you know, this is this is I. You can you can um, think rationally about the most important things in your lives and get actually make progress. Um, in um, uh, in understanding them and like processing them through doing so, so so um, uh, yeah, I, I think Wittgenstein had lots of great ideas, but one of his sentiments was was definitely one to be he wanted to be the one who closed it all, the one who and philosophy will never close. People are always going to want to do it and always going to make new discoveries, interesting intellectual progress by doing it, whatever Wittgenstein thought. So yeah. <laughs>
in in that one way, I'm not a huge fan of Wittgenstein. <laughs> So um, I have kind of another point, like the last point for sure. And like, I've been thinking about it. And also I've been thinking about the, like, um, as my friend described as Aristotelian view, which is that like the reality is incomprehensible. And therefore we need, we'll have some kind of irrationality after all. So like, I actually have kind of essay that I wrote about um, the narratives we create that are imperfect, but serve us well. So. Yeah, so I, I think that it's it's um, uh, one of the, the epistemology is a whole study of this. Of, of one of the um, interesting questions is just what um, it's possible to understand and what it's not it's not possible to understand, and understanding the limits and boundaries of that. And that's a huge question in a subject called epistemology. So it's it's a, um, there may be certain truths about the world. That we sort of, sort of in principle impossible for us to understand or recognize in virtue of how we're situated within the world that doesn't mean that nothing is such that we can understand it or recognize it that, that we can't ever know anything to be true but it may be there are these kind of liminal outside the box kind of truths that we we, we, we can't recognize understanding what they are and how to think about them is a very important issue in epistemology but okay, well, thank you so much, guys. I Professor, thank you. This thank you very much. I just wanted to say, just wrap it up. Uh, thank you for coming up and just sharing your valuable time. If you want, you can leave. I just had multiple things to say uh, at the end. Thank you very much, Professor Kasbaha, for this interview. Well, thank you, and keep. Up. I'm so glad that you you had so many ideas, and I, I hope you keep it up. Um, this is it's really great that that you're all going down this path. I, I just wanted to say at the end that like uh, we are having weekly this kind of sessions. Next session we're going to talk about with about post Soviet uh, history, and I hope that it will be interesting. So keep it up, like go to Sarveri, and thank you very much. Bye. Bye all.